them that they have the refreshment and renewal uh, that, that, that they need. We're going to turn to Philippians 2 this morning, uh, and I'm going to read the, the first 11 verses of that. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who in the very nature, very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thanks be to God. I want to start there this morning by quoting from that well-known philosopher, Forrest Gump. <laughs> My mum... Oh, actually, Nora Beth. Oh, no. Come on, come on, Nora Beth. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. My mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was far more authentic. <laughs> Life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> Somebody else said, life is short, so eat dessert first. <laughs> Somebody else said, life is like a hot bath. It feels good when you're in it, but the longer you stay in it, the more wrinkles you get. <laughs> but Jesus said, I have come that they and us may have life and have it to the full. That's what Jesus wants for you. He doesn't want you to be super pious. He doesn't want you to be anything other than the beautiful creation that he made you to be. And he loves you absolutely. And he wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to enjoy him. He wants you to enjoy serving him. He wants you to enjoy having fellowship together. Now the abundant life, the full life that Jesus talks about is of course not a life without any difficulties or, or, or problems. It's not a life that's always comfortable and, and, and secure. But it is a life in community. A life where we share together and we share with Jesus. We don't need a high priest. We go straight to the boss. And we share that fullness of life, the life that, that he bestows upon us. And if you want to live lives of love and compassion, then you need to get connected to the one who is the source of uh, abundant, full life. In practice, of course, this will mean different things to different people. It will depend on their life experiences. It will depend on their ability or, or disability. It will depend on their faith. It will depend on their personal characteristics. 
But our reading tells us whatever your picture is, whatever your perspective is, whatever your faith is, there is one who is above all. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory uh, of God the Father. <coughs> We've not, not got the PowerPoint. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Never mind. Still here. They want to come around here. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, we'll, we'll bypass that one. Part of the difficulty is that, that, that we have pictures, we have images, we have humanity. And all of that is, is a tiny bit constraining because we picture God from where we are. But what he is saying to us is I'm not there. I'm farther away in terms of your expectations and I'm closer than you could ever imagine in terms of a, a relationship. As followers of Jesus, we are constrained by the picture frame. And sometimes we, we, we recreate God because of our experiences and we say, well, that must be God because of. But the reality is that he is so much bigger. Sometimes things are not quite what they seem. I'm sure you... Many of you have heard the story of the six blind men, I think it was men, um, who came across an elephant. Uh, and one grabbed uh, the flat side of the, the elephant's tummy and said, ah, oh, yes, I've, uh, it's a wall. Another of the blind men felt it, it's a tusk and said, oh, yes, it's a spear. Another one uh, grabbed hold of its uh, trunk and said, it's a snake. The fourth one grabbed hold of the leg and said, oh, it's a tree trunk. And the fifth one grabbed hold of his flapping ear and said, it's a fan. And, and the sixth one grabbed hold of his tail and said, it's a rope. And they argued and argued as to, as to exactly what they were seeing. But no one could see an elephant. Isn't that true of a picture of God sometimes? That we want God to actually conform. We won't admit to it. But subconsciously even, we want God to conform to our picture of him. But God says, I won't be constrained. This morning, as, as part of uh, our current mini-series, which Freddie has grouped together under the banner of lifestyle, we're, we're looking for a few minutes before we move into, into communion. Uh, we're thinking about having a worthy attitude. But we can only have a worthy attitude if we're in tune with Jesus and if we're prepared to live out of our picture frame and actually strive for something that is so much greater, so much more real. And a fundamental verse for you comes uh, at verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, if you don't take anything other than Forrest Gump home with you, that's the, the one verse that we, we, we need to focus on. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Jesus, the one who put a towel around his waist, who washed the feet of, of others just moments before he went further into his passion, into his trials, into his betrayal, the agony of Gethsemane, the Jesus who loves to serve, the Jesus who in perfection hung on a cross for the sins of the world so that they and we might not have to suffer the punishment of all that humanity has done. But it takes faith. If Jesus is sovereign and Lord, and if every knee will ultimately bow before him, then it seems like a really good idea to have the same attitude as Jesus now. 
this will also maintain us, this will also encourage us to think of the bigger picture. Right, we've got, we've got some pictures now, we'll, we'll go backwards a minute, just for my entertainment, if not yours. What do you see? Two faces. Two faces. Anybody see anything else? Candlestick. A candlestick, yeah, or, or a vase or oh, yeah. some, something like that. Yeah. It could be the black, if you've not quite got it, the, the blackness is the faces and the whiteness is the, is the candlestick or, or, or whatever. Next one, Cole. What have we got here? A woman's face and a tree trunk. A face and a tree. Birds. We've seen, oh, seen the, the birds, birds. Yeah, in, the, in the red. Different perspectives. Next one, Cole. What can you see there? What, what animals can you see? Swans. Swans. Um, that's it. A ram? Maybe? Elephant, yes, there's three, there's three yeah. elephants. Might be an elephant. Oh, down at the bottom, <laughs> okay, the elephants, yeah. Three elephants there. <laughs> uh, and, and this last one, can you see anything hidden? Hidden, no. Look at the stripes. <laughs> oh, the word hidden. The word hidden is actually in stripes on, on the tiger. Hidden. Yeah. The, the reason for sort of uh, putting that in is, is, is just to illustrate how from our, our, our small perspectives, from our small picture frame, we might think we've got the answer, we might think we've got it right, Hidden tiger. but actually other people will see it in, 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 a, in a different, different Christians will see their faith in, in, in different lights, different perspectives. So the only way that we can break out of our narrow perspective, our, our our smallish picture frame is to walk in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. And fundamentally for this morning, for us to have the same attitude of Jesus as Jesus. And a quick reminder about who Paul was writing to. He was writing to the church at Philippi. Um, he was imprisoned, house arrest, um, but nonetheless lost many of his privileges of, of, of freedom. Um, in the, at the church in Philippi, which uh, had good things, there was also certain challenges and, and disunity there. Uh, and so Paul wasn't facing an, an ideal situation at, at Philippi. But at the beginning of chapter 2, he wants to, to encourage the people there, the church, uh, and so he offers words of real encouragement and, and positivity. He talks about the encouragement that comes from being one with, with Jesus. He talks about the comfort of his love, of uh, the fellowship that comes from a spirit-filled community, the, the heightened sense of, of tenderness and, and, and compassion. These are the things that, that Paul, writing with the Spirit of God, wants the church at Philippi to, to experience. Paul is, is saying, in essence, that life may not be perfect, but there is so much going on, so much for you, and you need to get on board. You need to share with one another, uh, and you need to share with, with, with Jesus. What else is, is Paul saying about the, the, the same attitude? He's saying that it is crucial to have the, the attitude of Jesus and put other people first. You move on, Carl. Verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Now, Philippi was not your average Greek town. It, it was multicultural, uh, multinational, full of different races, religions, cultures, creeds, uh, uh, etc., so, so when the people at, at Philippi are charged to be concerned for others, it's actually a, a, a very complex structure of, um, of, uh, of, of people there, from different persuasions, different faiths, different, different nations. Isn't it a, a lot easier if we just stay with who we know and who we are and who we like? Isn't that, isn't that so much easier? 
I mean, why, why, why step out? Why try to get people you don't really know? People who come from different nations, different cultures, different interests. Isn't it so much easier just to stay with like-minded people? Isn't it? That yes. is not what <laughs> Jesus wants. That is not what Jesus encourages to do. And some of us are well down that path already. Other of us are, have still got things to learn in terms of reaching out to people who are different from us. Th think about the people who you spend time with. Now, they're not the same as you, because praise God, when he created you, God wanted you to be unique. So you'll never find someone that's exactly like you, but you will find people who you can link with more easily than, than others. People who have similar characteristics, interests, maybe physical ability comes into it, culture. But is the balance of who you know, of who you want to reach out to, is it the kind of balance, is it the kind of attitude that Jesus wants you to have? One of the worst things uh, about being a church leader is that you spend too much time with Christians. And I've met, had many colleagues o over the years who have said the same as, as I do. I've got no excuse now, I'm retired. Um, so I'm, I, I was saying to Carol before the service that there's not a, ser a sermon that I haven't preached that uh, I'm not preaching to myself. And I know that I have to, to break out more. And I need to, to move away from being part of only Christian friendships. In the hope, of course, that one day they, that will be a Christian relationship. When you step out, when you have the attitude of Jesus and, and, and look to embrace other people, what are, what are you doing? Is, is it an act of mission or is it an act of love? Now, there's nothing wrong with, with, with mission, far, far from it. But there's a problem if in your relationships, in your meeting together, in your approaches to people, you kind of want to form... Uh, an evangelistic scorecard. That's not what Jesus wants. He wants to draw all people to him. But he says particularly that you need to love people. You need to love people with the Spirit's help into the kingdom of God. Happy days if you have known 88 people and they've come to Jesus. Maybe more. Absolutely brilliant. But fundamentally, they're not numbers, they're not statistics. They're not them, they're not the unconverted. They're people to love. That's a much better description than, than, than anything else. I feel really sad that in, in this multicultural country of, of ours, that too often the churches are full of white middle class Christians. Thank God for London. Thank God for some of the great cities. Where without the, 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 the black majorities or minorities in those places, the church would be so poor and so impoverished. But it, it's, it's not just about the towns and, and, and the cities. We need to make sure that our hearts are truly open, wanting to embrace the differences uh, of other people, but not just about nation or, or, or colour of skin. What about the ticking time bomb that is mental health? What can the church do? What can we do in, in an area that's long overdue for inquiry by the government and the authorities. But might we have a place in being able to support or, or provide or, or just listen? What about the needs of the disabled? Thankfully we've got a wonderful lift that everyone likes playing with. <laughs> but there's so much more that we can do in terms of disability, 
in terms of ensuring uh, politely but uh, with the spirit of Jesus within us to actually be a kind of an advocate to those who struggle physically with their disability or in, in other ways too. What about single parents? You know, if Jesus wants to love other people, there are so many single parents, and it's not that we, we need to go around saying, dear, dear, dear. We just need to say, can we do anything? That's what love is. Can we do anything? In part, anyway. And what about the older, isolated people, too? They're the other people as well. But they're not the other people. They're our people. They're all part of, uh, of God's family. Is there more that, uh, that we can do <clears throat> in our own domestic environment? Is there more that we can do in terms of our, our, our church life? We need to love other people. Verses 7 to 8. Jesus made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. The essence of putting other people first, especially strangers, is sacrifice. In doing this, we're following the lead of Jesus. There are so many around seaside who live lives of low expectancy, of lives of emptiness, and a lack of hope. And God's word tells us that we need to love them. Friends, it won't happen because we've got a coffee shop, but it might be the next few steps. And that's just one, one possibility. Not all of us live in, in, in seaside, but the same goes for, for where we live too. Whether they're flash houses, flash cars, or tiny flats, there are so many people who are so lonely and in need of the love of Jesus. Friends, we just need to compare notes. We need to encourage and support those who are brilliant at going out to, uh, in their neighborhoods, within their families. We need to support them. That will not be every one of us. We're gifted to do different things. But what really matters is that we have the heart for other people. Another attitude that, that Jesus gives us is that we should think like stewards. <coughs> Make my joy complete by being one in spirit and purpose. If we're united with Jesus and share his joy, his, his spirit and his purpose, then all that he gives to us will be for our care, our use and our, our, our attention. And this relates to so many uh, spheres of life. And I had a brief conversation before and the environment is, is, is something that we can do in a small way very, very easily. We can talk about the love that Jesus has for his creation. What we do with our, our money. What a fantastic result we had at our recent gift day. And uh, just the opportunities. We don't have to spend it all in church, but we have to be good stewards of how we use our money in family life, in in the things that we desire, in the missions that we support, the way we use our time, the way we use our buildings, and I'm not just talking about this building, I'm actually talking about our houses too. Are we good stewards? Not do we paint it every other week, but are we using the house as Jesus wants us to use it? Is there love in, the, in, in, in your home? Do you have standards that are shared of the things that you need to pay attention to? The church is, is God's gift. And so we need to regularly ask, what kind of church does God want us to be? 
Uh, and the, the last attitude that I, I read in these, uh, these verses it is one of humility. Uh, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. The servant will keep focused on, on what he or she believes is God's way for him or her and not spend time in needless criticism. Remember, it was Jesus who criticised the, the proud and haughty religious leaders who elevated the status of the downtrodden, who pointed to the relative generosity of the poor, who praised the sincerity of the sinners. In other words, as you know, the world's standard are that way, but Jesus' standards are that way. And he asks us, will you be good stewards? Will you live my kingdom ways with humility? Is your attitude like that of Jesus? These are just a few things that we've, we've, we've pointed to this morning. So much more we need to continue or, or, or develop getting into God's word to know exactly what it is. The fuller attitude of Jesus in, in our lives. We need to be obedient. We need to make ourselves available to him. Will you think first and foremost of other people? Will you be good stewards? Will you serve with humility?